Okay, hello everybody. Sorry for that slight delay. Um, for those who uh, were at the workshops this morning, you know who I am. Uh, for those who have just arrived, I'm Rob Quinn, the Executive Director of Scholars at Risk. Uh, thank you for traveling, whether from near or far, to be with us. Uh, these are our pre-Congress uh, Courage to Think Dialogues. Right? Uh, the Courage to Think Dialogues, to me, really are the um, the spiritual center, the soul of, of what it is we do and what it's about. Um, their conversations uh, with scholars uh, or their protectors, their advocates, um, who have experienced some of the kinds of pressures and threats uh, that our work is all about. Um, we initiated this idea of dialogues at our 2011 Global Congress, our 10th anniversary, um, in an attempt to replicate what was one of my favorite parts of our job, and I think for our staff the same, and for you at universities of hosted scholars, I imagine the same experience. When you have a chance to sit down and spend a little time chatting informally with one of the scholars that we work with. Uh, and I can't tell you how many rich conversations I've had, particularly, frankly, after a public event where they give a formal address and then afterwards, we're back in the office and we just have a conversation and we can ask some questions and we get some very rich and sometimes very um, amazing stories. And so we want to replicate to the best we can in front of all of us that, that kind of a conversational atmosphere. So it's our, our dialogues. Um, we'll have a series of dialogues this afternoon uh, and then we will formally launch the Congress after that with our plenary session here in, in the same room. Uh, and after that, we have a nice reception. So you have, have those to look forward to. Uh, tomorrow morning, I also want to just emphasize we have two dialogues tomorrow morning, uh, one on Iran uh, and one on Syria. So um, they're a little early in the day, but I urge us to try to get there for them because I think they'll be very powerful. Um, so with that, uh, I'm very happy to um, turn over our dialogue to our first uh, session uh, and invite our discussant to, to take us away, okay? Thank you very much, uh, Robert. It's a great thrill for somebody from Penn, Quebec, to be involved in uh, Scholars at Risk. There's a community of, of interest and of perception and of indignation in Penn as there is in Scholars at Risk. Uh, we, we are one of the oldest Pens in the world, in Quebec. We we'll date back to 1926, and Penn was founded in 1921. Uh, and we had the thrill last October to hold the 81st annual Congress in Quebec City. So it's in that, on that wave that I'm riding here with the pleasure of joining uh, Scholars at Risk. We have a great deal of interest in following from the point of view of Quebec because we are Francophones and because some of us are Spanish speaking also in our center in following issues and matters in South America or in the Sp Hispanic world. Uh, so the idea that uh, I would have to have a conversation with uh, uh, Manuel Apic, whose story is very much linked to one of the Latin American countries with Ecuador, uh, was a great thrill for me. So the, you probably know why uh, she's uh, uh, here. Uh, how she's here, she may explain to us a little bit, and then we'll try to follow through with a couple of questions for the 20 minutes that we're given. So she will, I hope, tell us uh, the reason of, for her presence and what happened that made her one of the people that, uh, in, in whose interest Scholars at Risk has taken. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Scholars at Risk, a lot for all the support. I'm a scholar of international relations, uh, French-Brazilian. I've been in Ecuador since 2004. And my partner is one of the indigenous leaders uh, who contests uh, the more strongly uh, governmental policies, ex 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 especially extractivism, mining, Canadian mining in Ecuador, Chinese mining. So he's been criminalized a lot, and for a year I was also criminalized, meaning intimidation by the police uh, to my apartment, my um, employers receiving letters tell telling them to fire me. Um, are all of our emails or cell phones being tapped and listened to by the police, being followed every day. I got to the point of saying hello to the uh, intelligence officers following me to work every morning. 
And in, this, in August last year, 2015, during a march, a national march in Quito, we were both of us arrested, beaten. He was released, I was well, we were both taken to the hospital uh, with uh, trauma on the head and uh, on the body. And during the night I was at the hospital, my visa was revoked. So by the time they, they took me out of the hospital at 9 a.m., they said I was an illegal migrant and they threw me in jail. Um, luckily, I only spent five days in jail. There was a lot of mobilization from the academic community internationally. Um, there was a lot of mobilization from the journalists community. I'm also, uh, I was a writer for Al Jazeera and for other um, international um, media platforms. And after a week, the, a judge told, said that I could leave jail, that there was no accusation against me, but that my visa was not going to be reinstated. So I had to leave the country. It was a soft uh, deportation. Um, and I was not able to re-enter since. The Brazilian government helped me a little bit. The French government was completely absent. Uh, they even told me, well, you're a journalist. That's part of the risks of your job. Um, and I've been applying for visas since then, unsuccessfully. I worked a couple of months in Germany at Freie University that gave me three months support. Um, the Protect Defenders at the European Parliament gave me a six months support now. I'm writing for International Cry, an inter indigenous media platform based in Guatemala. Um, and in September, I'm gonna be working at Amherst College for a one year interim uh, position awaiting for the government to change because basically as this government is in office, they won't let me back in. So that's the context. I think it's quite fascinating from the point of view, seen from here, uh, Ecuador does not have the reputation of being a very repressive regime. Uh, it has uh, uh, enhanced its image internationally immensely by hosting uh, Julian Assange. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting to see that the government which is uh, supposedly so uh, ready to confront uh, the great powerful countries like the United States or the United Kingdom uh, uh, by p having that gesture. And even the Brits who are, as you know, paying thousands of, of euros a day just to make sure that, uh, that uh, Julian Assange doesn't put his, his foot into the hallway uh, within that building. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting that that government should be so contradictory in doing this. And I, I'm curious to know, how, how can one reconcile uh, either an internal policy driven by anti-whatever uh, and a foreign policy which is presumably uh, very much geared toward freedom? When I, I'm French-Brazilian. I'm French-Brazilian because my mother was a Brazilian journalist and in the 70s during the military dictatorship, she fled to France and I was born in France. And when I arrived in Brazil, exiled from Ecuador, the friends of my mother, the feminists from the 70s, they said, we failed. We fought for 30 years for democracy. And here you are. Our daughters, the second generation is being exiled like we were. I'm sorry about the emotion. <laughs> um, but we failed. We've been fighting for Lula to arrive to power, for Dilma Rousseff, for all these leftist government to arrive. And what are they doing? They're expelling journalists again, just like we were. So what happened to the left? And that's why it's important to listen to academic voices in local context because we don't know where these contradictions are gonna come from. And it's not because these governments have had um, social redistribution agendas that they're not authoritarian in different ways. And there have been a lot of criminalization. I'm white, I'm an academic, I have a French passport, and I've been expelled and I was in jail. Indigenous people have been criminalized by leftist governments in unimaginable ways. These governments on the left have sold their land, have sold indigenous lives to international companies, Chinese, Canadian, more than right-wing government, with more impunity and with the discourse of um, redistribution. And so the question is always, right, what kind of democracy, what kind of rights redistribution? Can we redistribute some economic rights, silencing political rights? And, and this, this eternal disequilibrium between the two is not something of the past. It continues to be a major problem in Latin America and in, I believe in many other countries. Yes, but Assange, the same government that does Assange, mm -hmm. he does this. Is contradiction or, or 
on purpose to, to enhance their international image? What, what is it that you think? I think it's uh, for some people from the global south, it will not seem contradictory. These governments carry a lot about their image. Mm -hmm. And keeping Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in London is a way to buy international image and media power. Uh, Authoritarian governments in particular, they invest a lot of money and resources in maintaining an image. Uh, Ecuador has done it, and it's a way to clean up, to buy the international left in particular, and clean up its image while being able to do a lot of uh, human rights violation at home. So it appears contradictory to support Assange and give him asylum and expulsing me from Ecuador, but on another level it seems very uh, sensible. Right? You're maintaining an international image while silencing discontent at home. Do you think that the, the, your arrest and your expulsion has had some sort of a chilling effect on other people who are active in, uh, within Ecuador? Or, and has it spilled a bit over other people with similar concern in other countries, of, you know, very important mining countries like Chile, for example? Mm -hmm. um, I and, think and large Canadian interests, as we all know, of course. It had had a chilling effect, um, not on journalists, because they've been criminalized a lot already, but it was the first time a scholar was so explicitly punished uh, for her ideas in Ecuador. So a, a lot of the intellectual community in Ecuador uh, retracted, and many of them are international scholars like me. And so international scholars in particular are much more reticent to speak up. Um, because we all have families there, and so the cost is not only our career. We care about our careers, but if we are in Ecuador, we are concerned about other things that are our career anyways. If not, we would be in the United States at Harvard. Uh, but the family impact is very costly. Um, at the same time, the, there has been a warming effect in the sense that scholars realize that they cannot fake just to be in the ivory tower, and we all realize how our work is political. And there is no such thing as a neutral uh, scientific observation that is not involved in any field, but especially in the social sciences. And a lot of my colleagues in Ecuador have taken their profession more uh, from a political, as a political stand and not just as a, an observatory uh, methodology. Ha, uh, you, you've mentioned someplace that uh, you meant to go to the uh, Inter-American Human Rights Commission. Uh, are, are there any a hope of a response is one thing, because some governments receive uh, uh, sanctions from the Commission and then do what they pretty well want afterwards. But will, will that multiply the, uh, the interest and the attention to your case? Yeah, so we have, uh, I've been in many, I've used all of my resources to go into as many international forums as possible to destroy their international image. So we've been, I've been working uh, as a journalist in um, some outlets internationally. I was at the European Parliament uh, telling my story through frontline defenders who uh, opened the space for me there. I got a support from the European program um, Protect Defenders. And they won't get punished by the European Parliament because we know diplomacy and we know that states don't really care about one individual story. But it becomes uncomfortable for Spain, for instance, to keep supporting Korea's government when somebody comes and says in front of the Human Rights Commission at the EU Parliament that they've been treated that way. So it becomes difficult to maintain the image of Assange, right? We defending human rights uh, when it becomes obvious that they're violating human rights. So in that sense, it has been... Um, uh, costly for the Ecuadorian government to have me speak out. Not because there is going to be a punishment by one country or by a court. The specific case we're taking to the uh, Inter-American Court is the rights of the family. So I've been I, um, moved away from my family, refused the right to the family, which is part of the Ecuadorian Constitution and it's an international human rights. But in addition to that, we're defending and we're trying to set a precedent uh, with the indigenous marriage. Uh, we are married under indigenous law, so ancestral law. Ecuador is a plurinational state, so it recognizes indigenous jurisdiction since 98. 
the 2008 constitution reiterated the right of indigenous justice to have jurisdiction. So if there is indigenous justice, why is our marriage not respected? Why some families have more rights to exist than others? So we're taking our case to the Inter-American Court knowing that while this government is in office, there won't be any solution to my case because it's not a judicial case, it's a political uh, repression. But we're hoping to create a precedent in the long run uh, to validate indigenous authority in lawmaking, not only in terms of self-determination for extractivism cases, but also self-determination in civil law. So that's the hope. Um, try to use our personal lives also to do uh, shape theory and uh, state making. Has there been a response from the opposition? Is there a structured opposition that could indeed make it a case during the, the next electoral campaign? Is there somebody carrying the flag or the flame uh, in your defense? My case became very known in Ecuador. Everybody became very um, mobilized. Um, and it became the love story. It became the soap opera of Ecuador, right? The indigenous leader and the French Brazilian professor. And they tried to criminalize us and they really shoot themselves in the foot because the icon of state making in Ecuador is Bolivar and his lover Manuela. <laughs> so Manuela Science and there were two <coughs> other famous Manuelas and I became the fourth Manuela uh, with the indigenous leader trying to liberate the country from the bad dictator. And it really became a symbol of resistance uh, in a way, this love story. And it was a way to talk against the government without talking directly about the government for the media too. Um, so the story is a flag for anybody. And of course the danger becomes that a right-wing government can win and bring me back as a sign that they are democratic. Well, of course they, won't, they will may be democratic with me, but they won't be with other groups. Eternal problem. Um, the, the problem maybe is that the opposition is very um, weak. As any good authoritarian government, the first thing you do is to dismantle the opposition, divide the opposition. There are laws forbidden, forbidding free association in Ecuador. Since 2010, people are being jailed, uh, big groups, small groups, forbidden to participate in politics. And the government has been very agile in impeding any new political leadership to come out. So there are some, um, everybody's trying to ally, but the bankers are trying to ally with the indigenous movement. Obviously it doesn't really work too well. Uh, we don't really know what's gonna happen politically, but there are elections in February, 2017. I was gonna ask So that, I'm yes. hoping that yeah. by March, I'll be able to have a visa again. Have you had any, you seem to imply that you haven't had much support from the, uh, from the uh, your, your passport owner, which is France. Uh, have you had any support from other governments? Uh, the, the Brazilian the government, yes. and this is something I think we should keep in mind as scholars at risk, uh, organizations in general. Diplomatic efforts are really important because our academic solidarities are long term. We know that academia is very slow in moving and very slow in giving a job to a scholar. Uh, diplomatic pressure is very quick. It's very hard to get, but when it happens, just a phone call makes a world of difference. Um, so it's something we need to work on more. The Brazilian government supported me in the sense that they followed me in jail and they made sure I wasn't tortured in jail or anything like that. The French government was completely absent. They were on vacation with August Strait. France in August, nothing happens. Um, but it's, uh, it, there was as much support from the academic community and so much silence from the diplomatic side of things. And it was very costly. Obviously. Well, if I, if I may have an opinion on that, I've been a diplomat for 35 years. The, the, uh, the impact of diplomatic action is, has two faces. One, it can be public because it embarrasses the foreign minister because somebody in, in his country makes, makes a, a case. Uh, but it also, you can have access sometimes to a foreign minister who will, in an informal setting, in the other country, say at breakfast to the foreign minister, by the way, there's that name that keeps popping up. Could you explain to me what it is? At one time in privileged times before, way before last October, uh, when the last liberals were in power, we could indeed intervene with, intervene with Bill Graham, who was a foreign minister. And Bill Graham would have a little list in his pocket, which would be the Pan-Canada, Pan-Quebec list. 
and he would go to China or he would go to Egypt or he would go somewhere and say at breakfast in informal settings. I don't know that it has freed or liberated anybody, but it is certainly one way of, of, of making pressure, and there are two ways for diplomacy to work. Uh, and it's a shame that France should not have that picked up uh, on this matter. Uh, but then again, um, how can we? So the next deadline is, is elections in, in, in the spring. Uh, and what's your next move? Now we're going to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. We've and there's been... a deadline for that? No, yeah. and it's going to last five years, but uh, the goal is to generate precedence, right? It's, it's, a, it's a long road. There's not, it's not only my story. There are increasingly more governments, not only, on the, not only military dictatorships, but democratically elected governments on the left that claim to be democratic who are punishing scholars. So we need to generate precedence for the continent. And the Inter-American Court has generated many legal precedents for the world. So hopefully it's a way to invite the UN and other organizations to measure academic freedom or academic unfreedoms and to have it as a, as a tool of pressure and as, as a concern in their um, political horizons. Uh, the uh, indigenous associations in various countries in the Americas sometimes gather enough strength to, to speak loudly and be heard. Uh, is there anything that looks like that in Canada that you know of? In Canada? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, actually we, got a, we did a very interesting move inspired from Canadians, um, indigenous peoples. We created a can, uh, passport, a Kitra passport, mm -hmm. uh, and the Kitra community said that they would give me a visa. It, we didn't really dare using it because I don't want to go back to jail at the border, uh, but Carlos has used his passport and they have distributed over 500 passports for Kitra uh, members. That's great stuff. Uh, we have uh, 43 seconds for a question. <laughs> she has 40 seconds for an answer. Anything else you absolutely wanted to say? Uh, maybe I, want, I would like to say that um, I went to Ecuador. I was at the, in Princeton at the Institute for Advanced Studies. Um, which was a great honor for me. I was, I think, the first Latin American woman to enter there. And I decided to go back to Latin America as a form of activism because we can't keep all the brains in the North as usual and do theory always from the North for the North. And I decided to go back to Latin America for that. And I knew there, were, there was a price to pay, but I didn't realize that the price was gonna be that expensive and costly. And at the same time, it's been a very beautiful experience in the sense that um, my academic world, all the people I know, became very politicized after that happened. And I think little by little, we learned to be uh, more engaged, more activists <coughs> as scholars. And it's a collective endeavor that we all practice together. And um, I'm very grateful for the support of scholars all around the world um, in accompanying me in this process. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both for a wonderful discussion. As a token of our gratitude, I'd like to present you with a book, Johar Ilham, A Uyghur's Fight to Free Her Father. And now I'd like to welcome our next discussants, uh, Farai Gonzo, David Hambara, and Bonnie Campbell.
University of Quebec here in Montreal, and it's my pleasure to introduce our two guests this afternoon in the second section. Our first guest, Dr. David Himbera. You, David, are a scholar of economics and a former top economic advisor to President Kagama. You faced threats for your life and were forced to flee the country after questioning official economic data. At present, you're continuing your research at Centennial College in Toronto with the help of Scholars at Risk and its partners. In fact, related to the threats against you, David Hinbara just published a book about Rwanda and econom its economic development. Dr. Himbera, two days ago, we see reports of the shrinking space for academic freedom and freedom of expression in Rwanda, including harassment of journalists, government monitoring of personal communications, and increasing arrests of individuals critical of the government. How would you describe the current situation for intellectual freedom in Rwanda? And in particular, it would be helpful to know more about the space for free expression which exists inside Rwandan universities at present. And if not in the university system, does space for freedom of expression exist in the country more broadly? Oh boy, uh, there is, <laughs> I laugh because when I hear it, uh, space, uh, there is absolutely no space. I guess to, uh, to give you a sense of what I mean, uh, uh, there was recently a constitutional change that, uh, that is going to allow the, 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 the president of Rwanda to, to stay in power beyond uh, two terms. But to, to, to show you how there is no space, before, that, the, the, before the referendum that uh, took place, uh, Parliament uh, approved, uh, uh, basically was supportive of this constitutional amendment by a vote of uh, 99 percent. And then uh, the Senate of Rwanda approved uh, or supported the, this amendment by 100 uh, percent. Before the referendum vote was uh, took place, the, the Senate and Parliament went around the country to hear what the citizens had to say about this ch change. And they said that, uh, they concluded that uh, they found only 10 Rwandans opposed to constitutional amendment. Uh, this is a, a, a country of 12 million. So do you hear, do you see where I'm talking about? So either this man is extremely popular <laughs> or there is something seriously amiss. So, so there, is no, there is no space. And as, I, as you mentioned in your, in your introduction, uh, by the way, it's by, by pure coincidence, this wonderful person sat on my uh, 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 dissertation committee, but she was only 15 at the time. <laughs> the other was in 91, so great to see you again. <clears throat> yeah. So the space, uh, even my own story t t says a little bit about space. Um, I grew up here, decided that I wanted to, do, to, to make a contribution to Africa, then moved to South Africa. Then Rwanda, actually, the president of Rwanda recruited me from South Africa to, to lead the economic reforms. So to, then one day he walks in a meeting and he says, well, <clears throat> last year we grew by 11%. The economy of Rwanda grew by 11%. I said, no, you didn't. We, we, we were 3%. That actually, this is how, this is what led me to, to, to flee. Because there I was almost uh, thrown in jail for just that. I end up in South Africa. Two uh, or three colleagues have, have survived uh, assassination attempts. One died. Then I had to flee back to Canada. 
this here you see is not style. I've had, even here I have had to, to, to disguise. Uh, sometimes you might meet me wearing a, a Rastafarian uh, outfit. So it's very serious. Even here, I'm under protection. This is a government that assassinates every, uh, people everywhere. In the UK, warnings. So here, CISIS, you know CISIS? The, the CIA of Canada. Yeah, and then I'm under protection. I'm under protection, even Toronto police. So, but here, it's a lot safer than in a place like South Africa. There, there was a sitting duck. But here, I have to just make sure that I, I don't walk alone at night, and I look different every day, and I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. So, so I think I rambled on. So space, there is no such a thing. It's a theoretical construct right there. There's no space. Tell University, us. no. Tell us a little bit how that plays out in the university uh, in terms of people teaching, in terms of people being able to question and research subjects. Concretely, how does that play out? First of all, um, university is, uh, the, the main university is, is a government uh, uh, university. It's a public uh, university. Um, to begin with, uh, of course, the, the country itself, there hasn't really been like a, uh, a legacy or a culture of scholarship. This is the same country that has uh, that su suffered genocide, uh, you, you may recall, uh, two decades ago. And before and, and that, before that, that, that was a result of uh, another dictatorship. So this is a country that tends to flee from one dictatorship straight into another. So scholarship. Uh, it's, 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 extreme, it's like a, it's a job. You, you, you teach to earn a wage. Yeah, research, uh, non-existent. It's simply too dangerous. Uh, even scholars are returned, that, that go, go to study over, uh, outside Rwanda and, and, and come back. Well, they end up in a situation like me. I mean, my story is not unique. Uh, I, I, I can tell you, uh, I can easily tell you about uh, 20 people that went back uh, with, with an academic background wanting to do A, B, C, D, and it's just, it, it just wouldn't fly. It's simply too dangerous. You have to f toe the line or, or nothing. Thank you. We'll come back to both of you, but first I'd like to introduce our second guest, um, who is from Zimbabwe. Mrs. Ngonzo, you are a journalist, uh, and you faced also threats after producing TV segments that were criticized of, critical of local government policies. I understand you are currently pursuing a PhD, congratulations, at OISE U of T, with the support of scholars at risk. Mrs. Gonzo, Zimbabwe's 2003 constitution includes protection of civil and political rights, yet many reports show how the legislation is used to regulate freedom of expression association, particularly in the media, based on your experience living and working in Zimbabwe. Do you think individuals in Zimbabwe are afforded any such freedoms? How does one know where the line is, how not to cross it, and is self-censorship a problem in the current system. Thank you, thank you so much. Actually, the constitution was uh, drafted, was passed 2013 after a government of national unity. So what happened, uh, 2007, there was competition. Uh, the government, people were like fed up and people were kind of speaking up. It started actually from the University of Zimbabwe. Um, students went out, all out, to oppose the government. So students were instrumental of the establishment of the MDC, which was led by Changirai. So they faced adversity, they were beaten up, and all sorts of things. I'll go back to 2007, where I got involved as well. So life was becoming so hard, especially for the rural folk, 
So there was a lot of migration of people coming from the rural and coming and stay with their relatives in the urban areas. So there wasn't enough accommodation for them. So they started building up makeshift housing where they would house their newcomers, their relatives. So the support for the opposition was so great that the government was very intimidated. So what they did, they started demolishing those houses that were out of structure. They, they were calling them, they were, it was an operation wipe out trash. So they were demolishing, so people were homeless. So the government took those people and they put them at a squatter camp. It was a camp without any facilities, no water, no sanitation. So that's what we were doing now. We were going to those areas and interviewing those people, asking them how they were feeling, how they were coping, children, no school. So what we would you do, we would uh, collect their voices and then invite a government official and then open up lines, telephone lines, people would contribute. So it was like a no holds barred program. People would say whatever they wanted. So that's when I got into trouble. So they wanted to know who was behind this program and it was me. And I, I stood uh, before a parliamentary committee meeting and I was supposed, we were detained. There were three of us, me, the producer, the editor, and um, the one who was manning the studio, the operator. So we stood before the parliamentary committee meeting and we were detained for two weeks and we, we were released. They said we were to come back after a week. So it was during that time. So I was an intern at the United Nations before for 18 months. So I couldn't, they knew what was happening. They said, you need to leave the country now. It was like now, they said, you need to leave the country via South Africa, go by bus, leave everything. It was just like a dream. Then I went to America. I was in America for four months and they said, uh, there was the other two decided to stay with Voice of America. And they said Canada, America. And they said Canada simply because since I was four years, we were doing geography history of Commonwealth countries and just like Canada, Saskatchewan, we were singing all these things, the provinces. So I came to Canada as a refugee. And then, okay, we're talking about this uh, constitution. So this constitution came about as an agreement that we're getting into the government of national unity, but the conditions were that they needed to amend to have a new constitution. So there was a referendum and then people agreed to that. So the mediator was Tabo Mbeki, who was the president of South Africa then. But then Tabo Mbeki was a refugee in Mugabe's regime as well. So he employed a quiet diplomacy. So nothing much was like changing. And also the constitution is just something on paper. The laws that were governing before still stand. The laws like POSA, IPA, people cannot organize without the approval of the, the police. So these freedoms are, are the, it, it's not working. It's, it's just not working. So people of Zimbabwe were now, there was a time when they were putting up satellite dishes and they were getting information from both surrounding Botswana, South Africa and Zambia. So government went again on a spree which was, they coded uh, dishes down. So every house with a dish was a target they were targeted and they were saying you're getting information, foreign information to influence people to go against the government. So this is not working. This really is not working in Zimbabwe. Thank you. Just a word about the universities. Uh, you've gone back to studying in terms of the space in the universities. What limits it? What constraints? How does that work for people who are trying to um, put forward new subjects or, or explore the kinds of issues that you've been talking about? Okay. So Zimbabwe is rated one of the like, highest literate country in, in Africa with 98% literacy. People of Zimbabwe, after independence, they went to school a lot. And also they were affiliated to Commonwealth. It was a Commonwealth country. So we were getting scholarships from Australia, New Zealand, even Canada. But then Zimbabwe came out of Commonwealth, they are no longer a Commonwealth country. So to get an education, you have to dish out money from your pocket. An average professor gets maximum $600 per month, 
bad situation they are asking for 14,000 per person. And uh, primary education is free for all. Everybody can go to invest to primary education. And the schools, secondary schools are half primary schools. And universities, when I left Zimbabwe in 2007, there were only two universities. So now they are coming up with some church-related universities. So you see, it's a competition, uh, survival of the fittest. So people who get employed in the universities are people who are this, what we call chronism, people who are affiliated with the government, those are the ones who become professors. Even the students who get in are supported by the government because they can't afford. So to be free to express yourself, it's, it's a foreign word. It's at head of, it's, it's, it's so hard. Government also, when they had, uh, they had sour relations with Britain, we were a colon of Britain. And to be honest, Britain did a good work in terms of the inf infrastructure, education, all the social services were working very well when we got our independence. But now the, the relations are, are severed. So they engaged the look east policy. They are dealing with China a lot. So you find they're introducing uh, Mandarin in Zimbabwe. Mandarin is come, kind of come, becoming <laughs> mandatory because they are dealing with um, <coughs> China. So things are hard. We have a few minutes left only. Mm -hmm. And a question to both of you because of what we've just been presented with. I think it's important to know how you see possible areas of opening up of space actors, what actors, where should we be looking in terms of where are strategies emerging which would open political space or encourage freedom of expression? David? Uh, what I can say is that, that I encourage this great work uh, of, of even just uh, reaching out for, for scholars who are struggling, who have just come through this experience. This in itself is, is, is incredible. I mean, uh, it, it, you may not realize the kind of work you do, but uh, imagine I had been sitting at home depressed for about a year, not leaving my house in Toronto. Then for some reason I found you on the, on the website. Uh, and then an organization in New York found me a posting in Toronto. And the year that I've been there, I became a person again. I have been able to write a book. I'm researching, I'm teaching. So this work you're doing, keep doing it. Even just that one, one phone call, the, the, uh, my, my colleague there shed a tear earlier. I'm about to do that. I see Serena right there. It is the first time I'm seeing you there. <laughs> Continue doing the fabulous work. Also, like what he's saying, reaching out, not uh, necessarily scholars at least, I, I salute you. Universities here, you can invite people, even those professors, just for exposure, eye-opening, so that they can have a stint with you guys and then they can go back and they can spread, they can influence others to be able to stand up and be counted. And also the other thing that the government is using against uh, civil organization, especially the foreign ones, they're talking about human rights. They're saying human rights, who defines human rights? Whose rights are they? Because like when you grow up in Africa, like in my case, from six years you're able to clean the whole house to do dishes and do everything. But when it comes here, when you see a child doing that in, in, in white home, they call it child abuse, but in Africa it's socialization. And some of the powers that you give to children in our African context is disrespect. You don't talk back to your mom, but here you, you're told, oh, yeah, ex exercise your rights. So the government is actually using that against people who talk about human rights so that there is no boundary. They extend and then in the process they uh, violate children. So I don't know how it can be done, involved probably people from all nations to define the human rights, I don't know. But yeah, just reach out to people in academia. You give them three months stint, they go back 
and they have this exposure that everybody requires. Thank you very much. You have thanked scholars at risk, but I think on behalf of you, I would like to express our thanks for your courage to share uh, in these kinds of dialogues because it allows us to understand better the importance of what has been done. Thank you. Thank you to David, Farai, and Bonnie. That was a wonderful discussion. I would now like to welcome Alvin Chung and Thong Chai Winichikul. One, two, three. Okay. Yes, I think, I think we're on. All right. Okay. So, yes, thank you, audience. Thank you, SAR, for um, inviting me to moderate this session. And I'm very grateful that SAR put me in touch with uh, these two scholars here. Um, to, uh, to my right, it's Tongchai uh, Binichakul from Thailand. And on my left is Alvin Chang. Um, now in the US, but formerly based in Hong Kong. So uh, let us start by, by introducing um, uh, Tong Chai. Um, in addition to being an accomplished scholar of Southeast Asian history and a professor at University of Wisconsin Madison, um, you were also formerly a student leader during the um, undergraduate studies you did in, China, in, in Thailand, where you were involved in the pro-democracy movement. So as a result of your student activism at Tamasat University, you were imprisoned for two years. Do you see similarities between the crackdown in the 1970s and uh, following this popular uprising and the current regime's approach to policing dissident? Well, a number of similarities, a number of differences, of course. Differences is that uh, when I was student and I got into trouble, that is in 1970s, mid 1970s. Uh, the massacre took place at the university on the, you know, on the campus ground, and I was arrested from the campus ground. So the target is more, uh, let's say, scholars, students are more targeted. And many of them are in trouble directly to, for people like us, people in our profession. In current situation, the democratic movement, let me call, generally speaking, because it may be more complexity than that, is not a student or scholarly movement. The center of the protest, the center of the, of the conflict was not on campus ground. So uh, that's one difference. Somehow in 1970s is also the peak of the Cold War. That's the time, that's about around the peak of the uh, American and USSR conflict and also one year after into China Revolution. So we are ser seriously, we are seen as a threat, as an enemy. 
So in the 70s, it's much more, I would say it's much more brutal. Killing, killing, arrest, massacre. Today is, if we count by number of people who die, it's less brutal. But how about, I, I like to see any a study, serious studies, scholarly speaking. We read George Orwell as a novel. Don't we think that there, are very, there is a variation of Orwellian society? We may look at North Korea. How about if I say maybe a bit exaggeration, but I'm not, I don't think it's too much exaggerated. If we see Thailand as a form, as a variation of George Orwell, it means that today is more, is, and the scholars is not the main target, even though some scholars are in trouble. A few are in exile, a few are revoked passport, a few, quite a number of them are someone to readjust attitude adjustment. That's what the regime today is called. Then, it's, I would say, in general, the climate of fear and the climate that people know know that there's a line. There's a line there that we are not supposed to cross. How about yourself? I myself, I'm lucky you can say that I'm, I'm outside. And that's a part of it too, that in the past 40 years, 40 years ago already, this year, right, 1976, an art of an academic work on Thailand is you have to know the art of how to self-censor, what to speak, where's the line. I'm not sure I know it well, but let's say I, I think I know, I have experience with that. Even down to simple things like how to write in English, different from how to write in Thai. I would so. be personally interested in how you, I mean, with the change of technology and um, all this digital communication nowadays, and we're all aware of NSA and <laughs> issues like that, have you, um, I, like how do you communicate? Do you restrict your communication, email and so on, or do you think you are free to write? Same thing. Communicate? The principle is know how to write, where to write, when mm -hmm. to write, what which is a form of self-censorship, but mm. no other way. Self-censorship. Yeah, I myself is a low tech. Mm. I don't use Facebook, partly, I'm happy in the US, partly because it can be anonymous. So I don't, I avoid Facebook because I don't want people to know me. Mm. But let's say a lot of people in current generations, many of them sitting there, uh, they are better than that. But I would say the principle is the same. Know what, where, when, how to write, how to speak, how much to speak. May I ask, uh, are you still in touch with um, Thai-based uh, students, um, or has your, has your network shifted to the U.S. since you are based here? Well, now? not students. I have a lot good friends, a lot of, I mean, people my generation are students anymore, right? In many professions, including in, in the scholarly profession, yeah, I still have contact. Mm -hmm. I still write in Thai from time to time, but not as active as uh, 30 or 40 years ago. We will see um, uh, the upcoming uh, August 2016 referendum. Um, and will this uh, have an effect on the space of freedom of expression in Thailand? What do you think? I would defer this uh, question to people who know Thailand, current situation in Thailand better, to, to students there. They know better. So I, I have been a close follower of the situation in the country for 40 years, but let's say, to, to be precise, the current situation a bit too much for me. I'm not even sure it will help or not. Mm -hmm. Referendum is a referendum of a new constitution. Mm -hmm. This referendum was under the law for referendum which cannot, including <coughs> prohibition from expression. <laughs> It means that you can go and vote, but you cannot campaign. You cannot campaign for no. The government can campaign for yes. So is that a referendum? We have learned that since March 2014, coup gatherings of more than five people have been banned by the military junta. Mm -hmm. So this just as a background. Um, many have been arrested for gathering in peaceful protest, including an arrest around this time last year when more than a dozen Thai students from universities in Bangkok and Konkan were arrested following a peaceful demonstration uh, against uh, continued military rule. So 
just just uh, to give you a little bit about the background and uh, yes. Well, thank you. I would like to uh, to move to, uh, to the left here to um, to introduce you, Alvin. Um, you've been a barrister and since 2013 a scholar studying China's approach to the one country, two systems, uh, and. Um, uh, you've been wor recently working on the uh, authorities' uh, response to the umbrella protest. Um, the umbrella protest taking place in 2014, also called the Occupy Central movement. Um, the, the issue, as far as I understood, was uh, about how to elect the candidate for the position of the chief executive of Hong Kong. So who, like how to choose the, um, the position of, uh, of the leader of Hong Kong. Indeed. So, hmm? And, well, first of all, a big thank you to Scholars at Risk for having me here. Um, I have felt, frankly, a bit of a fraud being here because I've been relatively lucky compared to many of my colleagues, some of whom you've heard today. I am not at risk um, of being targeted by governmental assassins, for now. Um, there have been no concerted campaigns of thuggery or violence directed against Hong Kong academics. But I would like to say a word for Hong Kong and why it should be discussed here. The abductions of booksellers selling publications that contain salacious details of the goings on in Beijing earlier this year is a grim warning. And going back to the umbrella movement and its aftermath, one of the major lessons that the governments of Hong Kong and Beijing took away from the protest movements was the prominent role played by the universities, by professors and undergraduate students on both sides of the electoral reform debate. Although in the case of, for instance, the University of Hong Kong, primarily in favor of meaningful electoral reform. And what I have been documenting and writing about since then is the effort to suppress expression at universities. It's particularly appropriate to talk about this here because like Quebec, Hong Kong is increasingly grappling with questions of local identity after Occupy. And of course, the Chinese foreign minister threw a temper tantrum here the other day, I'm told, when somebody had the temerity to ask him about human rights. So I'm particularly pleased to be able to raise this here. <laughs> You've been, um, you've been teaching in uh, Hong Kong Baptist University and um, uh, at the time of the umbrella protests or um, around that time. So uh, how, how did that affect your, you in the classroom and your, your student group? Well, I taught a course on law and public affairs at Hong Kong Baptist University, in fact, a couple of years after the protests, autumn 2015. Um, almost exactly a year later. My class, however, was rather different from the students who took such an active part in the protests. My students were part-time master students, many of them in the uniformed services. So I was in the rather strange position of, rather than teaching students who would have been out on the streets demonstrating, instead my students were probably the type of person who would have been beating up or pepper spraying mm. the student demonstrators in question. This led to a very interesting dynamic. So um, how, did you, how did you deal with this, having people who would have completely different values to your own uh, in the classroom? It was a challenge essentially to continue teaching the materials I had prepared and my attitude going in was that I knew that complaints had been leveled against my colleagues at the university for being liberal-minded advocates for democracy and they were roundly criticized for bringing activists in to speak 
to give guest lectures in the classrooms, for instance. I myself was the subject of a number of complaints to department administration, and my response was quite simple and quite consistent. It was that I am not going to grade your essays based on what political views they express. I am going to grade them based on how well you answer the question and how well reasoned your answers are. And if you can't deal with that, or if you can't deal with ideas that make you uncomfortable, well, the doors to the classroom are over there and over there. <laughs> Did you witness the uh, umbrella protests, the Occupy Central um, protests yourself? Were you in Hong Kong at that time? I did. Mm -hmm. I was in Hong Kong when the Occupy Central movement began in earnest. I was there thanks to the generosity of the US Asia Law Institute at NYU. I was supposed to be there for about two or three weeks, essentially to get a sense of what was happening in Hong Kong at the time, which was relevant to my research interests. I was in fact encouraged to leave earlier. I had been informed that there was a very real possibility that the Hong Kong government would request the assistance of the People's Liberation Army garrison in Hong Kong, that they would be used to violently suppress the student occupation, and after that, they would target academic figures and people who had been vocal in the international media. So um, a question I would uh, like to pose to both of you is uh, what would you, um, recommend for student groups nowadays, um, which methods, which um, strategies could they employ to voice their opinions uh, facing uh, rigid um, regimes and um, difficult political situations? Um, well, what would you pass on to the next generation of student protesters, Tong Chai? I would not dare to do that because I think if you talk about strategies, talk about tactics, it depends on time, depends on local conditions. I would say that uh, such as, I mean, by a couple of students in this, from Thailand in, in, in this room, they know much better than me. For example, what would you think the experience of 1970s would be useful to today's social media world? No, mm -hmm. I'm hopeless, right? <laughs> I'm hopeless, so they, they have done much better than me. Local conditions are different, such as 40 years ago, academics, campus, universities, students, they are active. In today, democratic movement in Thailand, I would say many other groups of society are more active. It's not in relative terms. Mm -hmm. Students and, and, and faculty and academic are relatively less, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean they disappear, no, by the way. And by, when they say it's less brutal, it doesn't mean that no arrest. Mm -hmm. uh, and many academics are summoned. Mm -hmm. Attitude, adjustment, and release home. Mm -hmm. sign, many of them signed the uh, uh, signed agreement not to, not to involve in any political activities again. Mm -hmm. Many of them refused to sign. Uh, actually, after the coup, I think student movement become more vocal. Yeah. Yeah. Again, mm -hmm. they are more vocal, they know their tactics, they know their strategy. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, maybe advice of the older people, I don't think students should have strategies. In retrospect, they don't have. I didn't have. Whatever the best we can do is provide the space, protect the space for them to speak. The best way, the only principle and strategy, whatever you call, protect and fight for space for them to speak. That's all we need to do as a scholar, as older people. I think, on the other hand, last word, don't romanticize about student movement either. Sometimes student movement are active and useful. Sometimes it's horrible and, and how to say, look at Indonesia 1965, the massacre in 1965 in Indonesia, student movement co-opted with the regime, become partic participate in the killing of 500,000 people. 
So it depends on place and time. Okay. So. Picking up on that last point, um, Hong Kong itself has been grappling with the rise of what is now being called localism. Um, localism encompasses a great many ideas, not all of which are internally consistent. Some localists want Hong Kong to be independent from China, an idea which should be familiar to at least a few people in this room in another context. But the one point I would make is that Hong Kong's situation is not unique. And student, student activists and would-be legislators would do well to remember that, and they would do particularly well to continue making Hong Kong's case outside of Hong Kong. When, for instance, the Committee Against Torture reviewed Hong Kong late last year, early this year. It was a cause of much embarrassment for the government, particularly when they were asked about the seven police officers who beat up a restrained and unarmed demonstrator in a darkened corner. Incidentally, their trial is, I believe, ongoing, but they, we shall see if they get convicted. The demonstrator in question has already been, but the the short point to take away from that is making Hong Kong's case internationally works because nobody is listening domestically. Okay, so that was also the, the point I, I, I hope for you to say is that um, in comparison to earlier times, um, globalization um, is in effect. Uh, it is uh, possible and easy yeah. to communicate internationally and to draw on resources such as the SAR network. Uh, and with this last word, I would like to thank the, the audience and SAR and my discussions here for this thank conversation. You. Thank you so much, Pamela, Thong Chai, and Alvin. We are so appreciative of your thoughts. And for our final Courage to Think Dialogue today, I would like to invite Halil Ibrahim Yenigun and Chris Dejongkiri. dialogue. Uh, I'm really pleased to introduce you uh, to uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Yenigun. Um, you received your PhD at the University of Virginia in yes. 2013 and you are a professor of political theory and you you used to be, but we will talk about this. And then uh, you have um, the, the topics you are researching on are very interesting, and I think you already had a, a list of uh, different re re publications. You focus on uh, political ontology, uh, political theology, uh, radical democracy, comparative political theory, with a focus on contemporary Muslim political, political thought. So quite interesting topics. 
And my name is Chris and I'm uh, representing the Unica Network. We are a network of universities from capital cities in Europe. And so I'm happy to have a talk, a dialogue with you. Um, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So because we are talking, we will talk about the petition and uh, the, um, all the consequences that it can have to sign a petition and to ask people to sign yes. a petition. Um, so I understood that the petition that was organized by a group called Academics for Peace triggered really a quite um, strong reaction from the Turkish authorities mm -hmm. against uh, signatories and that many were dismissed, these academics, or um, like you also, and that moreover the Turkish uh, federal prosecutor launched investigations against them and with charges, and I quote, uh, including uh, charges including terrorist propaganda and insulting Turkish institutions and the Turkish Republic for signing the petition. And four of your colleagues were arrested uh, during these events. Do you have any news on yes, uh, they the have situation been, yes. and on the charges? Yeah. Yes, they were released on the 22nd of April. Uh, last month, I was actually at that time at Harvard University talking about the same situation. We were overjoyed by that. Uh, so that uh, particular charge of uh, terrorist propaganda, uh, so from that, uh, the now charge the, the, uh, was converted to insulting Turkishness, that the Turkish state and Turkish institutions, that other article, 301, and uh, the prosecutor needs to get permission from the justice minister for that. Uh, but they were released, fortunately, mm -hmm. and we, we, um, we have been overjoyed by that. But uh, still, the prosecution process is going on. Uh, there have been new dismissals, uh, and the disciplinary actions against our colleagues are in full scale, uh, nowhere to end. Uh, so that is the current situation now. So the situation uh, did not really improve, but no, uh, no. It's, uh, it, it, it's a little bit met, m less threatening for the moment for the colleagues. Uh, we are basically uh, now just waiting. Waiting, yeah. So yeah. the next step to, or like when the president uh, decides to move uh, to the next step, we don't know. So it's yes. basically getting his mind at this point. But I was told that some um, associations, some universities sent some uh, observers to some of the uh, trials and that, is, uh, that, was also, that, that had a good effect on uh, the situation. Uh, yes, that, so we, that, those are our conclusions from our observations. Uh, so, what makes positive change, what doesn't make any change? Uh, so, yeah, uh, international representation in that particular case uh, was instrumental in our opinion, but... Uh, we still have to wait. We still until, have, yeah. but, but uh, so the process is still going on. So, and also, like, there are some other side effects. For instance, the, uh, the uh, to be like what we call the Turkish Academy of Science, uh, and they, they are uh, not approving projects by signatories at all. So uh, I have just received news from a friend of mine. So uh, an event uh, sponsored by the culture minister. Uh, so in that event, my friend uh, was basically uh, crossed off for being a signatory. So these kind of effects are in full scale, like with each and every event, each and every scientific or cultural event, if you're a signatory, uh, and if government somehow uh, has some part in that, so they are crossing you off. Uh, so it, it is a full scale persecution, basically. Okay, the, the, all the situation was covered by the media extensively, official media, uh, uh, social media. Uh, that is the problem basically in Turkey now. We still have some kind of representation in the media, uh, but the government's hands are basically extending everywhere at this point because uh, we must see that the government at this point uh, is not just a, a political entity. It is a huge complex of 
uh, media and civil society, like Congo, more than civil society, uh, and economy. There is a huge political economy behind the current power, uh, which has co-opted so many constituencies, so many uh, civil society actors, and which still goes on uh, in full scale to, uh, to colonize all life spaces in the society. So it is really hard, and the media has uh, its fair share now. Uh, so the the, the new uh, instrument of government, basically to take over the society and colonize society, is to take over institutions. Uh, they have just taken over two institutions: uh, Halic University and uh, Mevlana University in Konya. So one of them was the Gulen Movement's university; the other one. Uh, wasn't actually uh, the other one's uh, owner was even close to uh, the current government in some ways. But now we are at the level of uh, uh, intra-government fractions. So it is at that point, like the struggle is at that point now. It must have been personally a very stressing situation for you. No, your family. I'm among the luckier ones. How, do you want to share something about it? Uh, uh, how did you affect it, you personally, and uh, did it change your mindset? Uh, and what about your family? Uh, how, how did you live with all this? I'm, yeah. I'm among the luckier ones uh, because we have uh, now like listened to very dangerous situations. Uh, so uh, it, I would be ashamed to talk about my own personal situation. We are the, among the privileged. But uh, actually, uh, it wouldn't be me, but uh, one of the arrested friends of ours uh, who would represent Academics for Peace here now, they couldn't come. Uh, so. Uh, we must share the reasons for that. So they were out of job, so they couldn't show income to come here to, for the visa, basically. Uh, that, is, uh, also, that also shows something about our uh, global standards of like visa and admission and you know, travel. So there are these kind of restrictions, uh, even though they're not formal, they could be these kind of indirect ways. Uh, so they couldn't come for that reason. And uh, so some of our colleagues have terrible bans, so that is another measure that the government has imposed. They can't leave. Uh, so I was lucky uh, in the sense of like I, I, I came here for a conference back in April, and I have been going around uh, giving lectures and attending conferences. So then they sent me, they delegated me uh, to say something on their behalf. Uh, so our four colleagues, Esra Mungan, Kavanj Ersoy, uh, Muzaffar Kaya and Megal Jamji, and uh, uh, so Esra was actually put uh, in jail, like during that process, uh, in solitary confinement, along with uh, people who were doing life sentence. And uh, these moments were more stressing for us who were outside, uh, because we could have been there. Uh, so these four academics, what makes them different, uh, is the fact that. Uh, after the first petition and after all the crackdown and all the insults by the president against us and all the prosecutions. Um, so uh, the war in the, uh, in the southeast uh, of Turkey, the Kurdish cities, uh, it continued and uh, we witnessed huge massacres. After that, uh, people were burned alive in the basements. So they say they were uh, giggled us, but who knows who were they and uh, who knows like who would make sure they were all giggled uh, or uh, not civilians. And uh, we have reports uh, that uh, say otherwise. And uh, all these things uh, happened after we signed the petition. So academic situation is nothing to compare uh, when we think about the Kurdish cities and the victims of curfews, mm -hmm. the civilians, the children, the 65-year-old uh, women uh, whose body was left on the ground for 10 days. Uh, so we had those cases, those, those disastrous cases, and we, we had seen that. And Esra, the uh, professor of psychology at Boazic University, so she had been there uh, right before her arrest, and she had seen the scenes, and she was so depressed. Mm -hmm. So she came back, and we gave a, a statement, a second statement about what had happened. Uh, after the first statement, both about, about ourselves, academics, and also about the Kurdish cities. Uh, and uh, these four colleagues of, uh, colleagues of uh, us, they, they were the ones who read out the statement 
in the second time, the second statement uh, about the updates, uh, and they were picked because of that. So mm -hmm. I could have been there. I was out of town to see my kids. Uh, my kids are living out of town. Uh, so th I had travel plans. That's why I were there to read that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, could, I, I could have been there. Yeah. I could have been yeah. there to read yeah. that, and yeah. I could uh, ha have served that jail time. Uh, it, it, it was not jail. It was an arrest. So it is a, also a new instrument by the government. Uh, but what st struck me most during those days uh, was what Meral Jamji did, uh, because uh, first three of uh, them were arrested, and Meral had been uh, to Paris in the meantime. So she was outside. She was abroad. And uh, when the three of uh, her colleagues were arrested, uh, she went back. She went back to be arrested, basically. She knew she would be arrested, and she went back. And this was a form of defiance on our part. We showed uh, to the president, to the government, that we don't fear you. We are not mm -hmm. afraid of you. Uh, you are trying to intimidate us by all these punishments. Uh, so you are trying to silence us uh, to speak, not to speak truth to power, but we are here to say what we have in mind. This was actually our point. And uh, what I learned during this process uh, was uh, that one, that particular thing that Meral did, she went there to, to get arrested, to go to jail, and she said, I am not afraid of you. Do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue to speak. So this is a kind of dark picture, some sparkles of uh, freedom of speech. You, you try to take yourself by um, uh, mm. doing like this. It's, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, I wrote a piece about it, and I, like, said, yeah. I, I said uh, on on uh, freedom and on free people. And yeah. I said, in Turkey, we don't have freedom, but we have free people. Yeah, but overall, the, yeah. the, the landscape, the, the university landscape, academic landscape, is a lot under pressure in uh, Turkey for the moment at the universities. And uh, do, yes, because do, some, those colleagues, some colleagues, yeah. I, when I understand, some colleagues do not know when, whether their contract will be renewed or whether they will be dismissed or what will become, because there is a lot of uncertainty uh, uh, going by all this pressure. Uh, and I, I have a question for you also concerning the content of, of lectures, the content of research. Do, do, do your colleagues and you feel that there is a, a pressure on not uh, lecturing on certain topics, on non-discussing mm -hmm. certain topics? What are the topics? What is so, so sensitive? What is so uh, difficult? Huh? So those, those of us uh, who have broken our chains, uh, we are the free ones, basically. We have no, nothing to hide. And I, I, I have come here to talk. I don't fear uh, what, what, what will happen to me. And I said, you could televise that, no problem. Uh, and I'm going to go back. So th there's no problem with that. So uh, we are actually the free ones in that sense. But the ones uh, who couldn't sign or who had to withdraw or uh, or, or uh, who somehow like uh, remained outside this prosecution process, uh, they have less freedom in that sense because they are more fearful now. So this has happened to us. So uh, they have been silenced even more. And I'm hearing from my friends and my former students, uh, now they can't even uh, make insinuations to some topics. So we, we, we used to speak out in the past now. Uh, it is even hard to make insinuations. Uh, it is to touch on certain topics. So it has become, uh, in that sense, so depressing. And, and there have been uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of cases where uh, the professors, uh, because of their lectures, uh, they, they have been uh, subjected to disciplinary investigation. Uh, something like that just happened yesterday or the day before, I guess. So it is an ongoing process. And this is just a reflection of uh, the whole country's new situation. And for our uh, part, we are, uh, in, in a certain way, uh, we are happy to uh, see that uh, there are new areas of resistance in Turkey against authoritarianism. So this has freed us in certain ways. And uh, I think uh, we should not underestimate uh, the post gezi uh, political subjectivity, like the three 2000, uh, to, to 2013 events, June th 2013 events, uh, and the political subjectivity that emerged after that. It is a new one. It is something uh, that surpasses what we used to see in the 1990s, 
in, in, in the 2000s and uh, pre 1980 Turkey. It is something beyond left and right, beyond uh, this ideology, that ideology. One thing about academics for peace is we don't uh, know about our ideologies. Like, I, I never know, like, whose background is what. Mm -hmm. We don't, uh, this is any kind of uh, ideology for us, if you had to say something, like the peace ideology. We call it that way. A new subjectivity, and this is, uh, again, like, post-June uh, 2015 political subjectivity as well. Last year's elections uh, was also a turning point in Turkish politics, which uh, was followed by uh, the palace coup, uh, because the elections uh, was supposed to uh, take the government away from power and form a coalition government. But this did not happen, no. because the president manipulated this process and uh, prevented the formation of a coalition government. Mm -hmm. It was the first time in Turkish politics that uh, when you have the election results and you are supposed to have coalition government, it doesn't happen. So, because the palace is blocking the way. The prime minister would do that, we knew that. And uh, what happened later, uh, you know, the prime minister now is out of job. He was also kicked out by a second, a second coup by the palace. But what could the international academic community do? What, what would help? Uh, the, the academics in Turkey and the universities in yes, Turkey? Yes, at this point I have some radical uh, suggestions. Uh, I, I would uh, suggest my personal view is to do uh, a, at least a short-term academic boycott uh, for academic events because what lures people to, tur to Turkish e events uh, is that uh, the government is pouring money uh, to these universities for these events and uh, you get all these you know, hotels and uh, the all uh, meal and everything, uh, and honorarium and everything. So uh, people like that. People like that, and um, that's how. That's what what the the Turkish government and Turkish ac poor government academia thinks they could do uh, by inviting like these high profile uh, guests to their events uh, by giving this uh, scene of internationalization of Turkish universities, which is quite a sham because uh, we don't have that much research going on there. And uh, we are uh, now like losing the one that we had, we used to have. Uh, it is going worse actually. And the, the one thing that hurt the Turkish uh, government most and the program at academia uh, was the case that IPSA conference uh, was canceled uh, due to security reasons, they said. But uh, it was actually, uh, we believe, our efforts was also instrumental in the cancellation. And it really hurt uh, the government because they don't want uh, this uh, reputation and also the money is involved there. You know, big conference from all over the world, tourism sector. And what hurts actually the president now is economy in that sense. If he loses money, then he's hurt. If the, the reputation is at st stake, it hurts. So uh, in that sense, uh, I would suggest uh, if at this stage, uh, un unless the prosecutions and unless the disciplinary investigations and stop at this point, we are not going to Turkey, we are not coming to your event in Turkey for this particular thing because we hear that your university is still doing this. Uh, and unless you stop, we are not coming. So these kind of reactions will work in my opinion. And did, it, did all the events and all your experience made it you stronger as a person? Made it you look uh, differently at, at situations? Uh, and what about the community here, scholars at risk? How, how did you interact? How did you find out? How did you feel about this? Uh, is it important? In what way is it important? Yeah. Uh, Yes, I, I think scholars at risk uh, has to be bigger, has to be like better known, uh, has to be more active. Uh, so yes, uh, when we are in trouble, we most of us get to hear about scholars at risk. When we are not in trouble, we don't hear that often. Uh, so it's man, like many of us your assurance, your academic assurance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Police, yeah. 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 So. Uh, uh, I'm very glad to be here, uh, and I feel myself very fortunate to be here. Uh, normally, I do human rights work in Turkey, I used to do, but for some other people, for some other cases, 
uh, for some of the human rights cases, but right now, like scholars, uh, the human rights of scholars is something else that uh, I was never doing any work on, uh, but now uh, I see that there is much more need uh, on this, because I used to think uh, of that as, as somewhat selfish in a certain way. This is our problem because our personal problems. So again, like compared to the Kurdish people in Turkey, uh, our problem is nothing. Uh, so we spent four days, uh, like our friends spent four days in jail. Actually, uh, I, I was never been to uh, prison. So uh, there are certain levels of victimization and I don't see myself as a victim uh, when I think about all these situations and also when I look at the uh, cases of Syrian academics, for instance, or Iranian academics, for instance, Chinese uh, academics in uh, certain ways. So, uh, but of course, like now we are in the same league <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> okay. so, and we, there are so many of us. We are over now 2,000 two thousand people. And uh, one good thing about the defiance was we were uh, 1128 to begin with. And when the president attacked us, insulted us, called us pseudo academics, and uh, so the number increased to 2,000. So we are now more than 2,000. So uh, this shows that uh, the resistance against this kind of authoritarianism might come out of uh, this academic, uh, the scholarly and uh, academic coalition. And again, like this coalition is a very wide-ranging coalition, and we uh, we we call it a new uh, post Gezi or post uh, June uh, po uh, ideology, I would, or like set of ideas. And okay. these ideas are about peace. These are these ideas are not about Islam versus secularism. Th that that was the misleading thing about Turkey for a long time. They used to think, uh, though this country was like first in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. So uh, pro-Western, anti-Western. Pro-Western, these are our guys. Anti-Western, these are the opponents. Then it turned into like uh, Islamist secularists, then it turned into uh, moderate Muslims and this and that. But uh, these categories don't work. So what we have today is not about Islamism versus secularism. Uh, I, I'm coming from another background. Like my father was one of the Islamist uh, leaders in the country and he was killed in 1980. Uh, and Kıvanç had a socialist background. Uh, and Kıvanç sent me a letter when he, he was in jail. Uh, he, he sent me a letter and then he published that. And uh, in that letter, he's, uh, he, he said he thought about my father, how like, his efforts for peace uh, was very valuable for us. So this is a new setting, a new political setting in Turkey. And uh, scholars of Turkey, I, I would suggest uh, we have to observe it closely. Something new is in the, for, in, in the formation, something different from the, the previous eras. So those categories won't work. Uh, whether Erdogan is Islamist or not, this, one, this doesn't work. It has nothing to do with that. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, all your experiences and uh, thank you. I would like to thank you. Thank you so much to Halil and Chris. I would now like to open the floor for any questions or general discussions for any of the participants that we had today for the Courage to Think Dialogues. We have microphones. Actually, I have a question uh, for you right here. Uh, um, Um, you know, when you were talking about um, what uh, people from outside of Turkey could do and so on, um, isn't it important at the moment when the European Union is making deals with Turkey and strengthening the government, isn't it quite important for, you know, any sort of scholars of conscience in Europe to actually confront their own governments about this? Uh, 
So, uh, what I say is uh, would in no way favor any government on Earth. Governments are no better than each other. Uh, they're, they are just like less worse governments, basically. And uh, so we have seen that with EU and how they could do the bargaining on the refugees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on the on the refugees, like it was uh, we in Turkey we called it like this horse bargaining, basically. Uh, so you get the money, I'm going to keep the refugees. I'm not going to let them out, but you give me the money. It was this kind of uh, shopkeeper deal, basically, between Turkish president and the EU. And I, I believe that we, all of us uh, saw that and feel ashamed of the government, right? So uh, Turkish president knows actually how to deal with these issues by bargaining. Uh, by, uh, so you do this, I do that. We are all good. So what happens in between uh, what, what, uh, is what happens to us, basically, to civilian people, uh, to people in the civil society, to scholars, uh, to people who, do, doesn't have, who don't have anything to do with governments. So uh, the EU bit uh, is long time over, as you know, like uh, both sides are kidding each other in that sense. Uh, so it was an instrument for the Turkish government uh, to get rid of the military tutelage, which was a good thing, of course, but we are uh, past that concern now. We have some other issues, some other big issues. Yeah, uh, I would like to ask, to ask a question on Rwanda. And uh, if it's possible, I would like uh, you to tell us a bit more on the spaces and uh, the discourse that is constructed uh, on Rwanda because uh, it is presented as a country that is doing very well and uh, we're seeing many professors from Harvard going there and teaching, himself, uh, uh, President Kagame going <laughs> for giving some classes at, uh, at Harvard, and then um, among his advisors, uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair is counted like one of his advisors. At the same time, we meet people like you uh, in, uh, in many places around the world who can't find sp space to live in there because there is uh, much terror. Uh, the president seems to be the only one whose voice is understood exactly in the way uh, you, you, you said, I met somebody telling me that uh, um, uh, any science, any knowledge to share with him didn't count. It's only what the president says that is uh, count. So how can you, how can you explain that uh, this may happen at the same time such things happening, at the same time uh, much support from the go uh, global uh, space? Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for that question. Uh, I think I can begin to explain it by going back to uh, the, genos the history of genocide in Rwanda. Um, when genocide happened uh, in 94, uh, there was resistance uh, to intervene, especially from the United States. There was even the word genocide, there was an attempt not to define the, the, what was happening there as genocide. Because you may recall that uh, Rwanda happened after Somalia. Somalia was a disaster for, 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 uh, for those who are familiar. The, the, the American uh, intervention ended in disaster with a loss of American soldiers, uh, not to mention hundreds of uh, Somalis. So Rwanda comes after, there was no power willing to put to, to invest in, in that conflict. So then genocide happens. Uh, then while you have uh, happenings immediately after, you have this guilt from the, from the West, especially again from the, from the United States. In particular, the people who were in power then, uh, Bill Clinton, and then shortly Tony Blair. Uh, so they seem to have now overcompensated by becoming protectors of, uh, of Kagame. So Kagame 
uh, also invent what they we now call uh, the, the genocide capital. Uh, he, he has to cash that capital. So whatever he has done, you know, actually what he has done uh, in Rwanda is not, nothing compared to what he has done in the neighborhood. Kagame invades Congo three times and over five million people have died in Congo as a result. That is five times more than the, the, the people who died in Rwanda itself. So then there is this incredible stories as you, you are describing. On one hand, there is this person who has, who has killed so many people, who has, no, I, 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 I try, especially after my friend the, the, who spoke and then me I, uh, cried, I tried to kind of uh, suppress my own story. Half of my family is in jail in Rwanda over a conflict that began over a fight, over statistics. So his story, he has told this story that, okay, human rights can wait because I'm building Singapore of Africa. This is what he has, this is what he has sold. And then some people have seen this as a, a success story. And those people who seek, who, see, who uh, I'm sorry, I'm rambling too much. Let me just perhaps towards concluding this answer to you, the long answer to your question. You may also recall that Clinton invented this term, uh, the new breed of African leaders. The new breed of African leaders were Kagame, uh, Museveni, Isaias in, uh, in Eritrea, uh, Meles in uh, uh, Ethiopia. And these people are supposed to be bringing them development and democracy. They have actually turned out to be the worst dictators with a facade of development. So, I mean, we, we, I can't uh, ramble on much longer, but indeed there are two stories. On one hand, a terrible dictatorship, but on the other hand, something that seems to be working. Because you, you actually answered it yourself. He is the only one who is, who is Kagame is the only, the only one who is allowed to tell the story. There are no universities, no, no professors to tell the story. There, there, is no, 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 there are no journalists to tell the story. He is the one who is telling the story. I'm sorry. I want to make a comment, I want to make a comment on this issue because <clears throat> Here it's the like good people of academia, but there is the bad people of academia. <clears throat> and to give an example with Ecuador, <clears throat> the president of Ecuador was a colleague of mine. He worked at the university. He's a professor in economics. And he cares a lot about his legitimacy as an academic. So for instance, <clears throat> he was invited by Harvard to give a talk. And of course, if journalists discovered that Harvard's department who invited him received $35,000 a week before it was justified as the money for refreshments. <clears throat> he buys the opportunity to give talks because it cleans up his legitimacy, because academia has a legitimacy. He has received over 20 uh, honoris causa degrees. The last one was after my expulsion in France. I wrote to the Foreign Affairs Ministry in France, I wrote to Congress, I wrote to the president of the university. He said, oh, we understand the situation, but..." We have orders from the Foreign Affairs Ministry to, to, to give him the honoris causa. So academics, academia don't only play one way, it plays both ways. And academia has been used to legitimize authoritarian governments and to silence other academic uh, spaces very often. So I wanted to bring it up. I just have some comments, but uh, I apologize in advance for my English. <laughs> Actually, uh, the, the first question I remember when uh, about the Ecuadorian which received a change and a change, uh, and why why this? Actually, even I'm co I'm coming from Syria. Even Bashar al-Assad, which is known as dictatorian dictator uh, dictator. Um, received the opposition of Iraq, Iraqi opposition. 
That means, in general, even the dictators, they are receiving the opposition of other countries. This is one of the image, uh, one aspect of the international image that they, they are defending the dec democracy in other countries, but not in the same countries. When, uh, when the people to are talking about something wrong in, in this country, it becomes a red line. This is, in gen this is what um, I, I learned. And another comment about the Rwanda and what's, what's I, th I think it's classic what's happening in, unfortunately, in Rwanda and Syria now and a lot of countries which is now uh, f comparing to Turkey, now it's good, very good, until now, very good situation in Turkey. But if sometimes there is a small, um, small stories, which you mentioned that it's not a big deal that you just have some threats maybe or, but it, it will become very dangerous because if we don't talk about these stories, even it's not, until now it's not very dangerous, but we should talk about all this story. And again, thank you a lot for Scholars at Risk to, um, what, for all what you are doing for scholars and because, yeah, I'm sorry again for, <laughs> thank you. I think we have time for one more question or comment if anyone else wants to close it out. This is the Latin American way. <laughs> um, I wanted to bring an issue that I felt uh, recently. Um, I don't know exactly what to do with it, so I wanted to put up for consideration because obviously all of us who are here are activists and are concerned with these issues but two weeks ago my colleagues uh, who remained in their jobs and who have a salary and who were publishing and who were going to congresses wrote to me from one of the congresses in my field saying oh hello everybody's thinking about you and I got really upset because I don't have the means to go to congresses and I don't have the time to publish as, as much and now just giving these examples that we have been giving we spend a lot of time, those of us who are committed, so mostly those of us who are here, we spend a lot of time with activism. Writing letters to the European Parliament, coming to this Congress, writing letters for other, um, writing reports on academic and freedoms. And it's a lot of time that's not validated, not counted in academia. Um, so of course, uh, since this happened to me, for instance, and those of us who have gone through it, we know that We've gained a lot of legitimacy among civil society, maybe, among journalists, among human rights activists. Amnesty International knows us, Scholars Art Risk knows us. But within academia, we are publishing less and we're less active in the traditional way that's validated. And, that has a, and that's one more cost, right, of doing the scholarship we do. And so I'm wondering, in all of these pre-meetings we had, right, um, uh, evaluating academic freedoms, how do we account for this activism for us as scholars, right? How do we change the system so the system validates our activism, our work to maintain academic freedoms, right? To support other scholars in the world. How do we make that visible and validated uh, in the long run for all of us? Uh, just to respond to to hear about where we can go to be heard. Uh, actually, it's a possible top, topic that I, I want to look at as well. 
that uh, a lot of academia are writing, and but who are they writing to? Who who hears them? So it's also something to consider to have like an academic forum, like a radio station, whatever, where you can publish, you can talk freely without waiting for the mainstream media to give you two minutes for an interview. You can establish a forum where you can speak freely. Uh, to respond to Mr. Caput, he was saying, uh, sometimes you see this person talking here, but the people from his country are running away. Uh, there's the dependency theory. The people in power, they collaborate which, with each other so that they can stay in power. Um, take, for example, Robert Mugabe was the chairman of African Union for the past two years, but everybody's crying foul that he's oppressing people. But why didn't they buy him to become a chairman? So they are collaborating, they are in cohorts. That's my answer. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time. <laughs> one last question. You have one minute. Um, I was uh, telling my friends yesterday that the present African leaders uh, were made by the West. Uh, my friend from Uganda tells us that Museveni who has been in power since 1989 Kagame, who has been in power since 2000, um, Isaiah Saforki of Eritrea, who has been in power since 1993, Maladenawi, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, died in 2012, but he assumed power in 1991, and uh, a lot of them. All those leaders were considered revolutionary, you know, uh, revolutionary leaders of Africa by the West, by EU, you know. Actually, the present, we know the modern uh, African political geogra geography is the making of the West. It's the making of uh, the creation of European colonial powers. And still, they have hand, they have say in the fate of Africa in the fate of Africa. Uh, as I said, we have to advocate, we have to focus on advocacy of the West because the West can have influence on Africa and can, can, can change uh, Africa. As a, um, the present uh, government, EPRDF government of Ethiopia came to power in 1991 with the support of USA, the State Department. So, uh, you know, so we, are, we are in vicious circle. And uh, we cannot, I think, uh, we can change that by advocating with, with the West. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Sarita. So um, thank you, everybody. Uh, we're going to end this session right now and just have a, a brief break. But I wanted to uh, personally thank, of course, uh, Serena for taking the questions, moderating, but for the discussants, for the scholars who participated, thank you all very much for sharing uh, your experiences with us, OK? And if I can just end us with on a response to Manuela, because um, I think the question you have is a really important one for our work, right, which is, um, I see all of what we're doing is really about this combat over the legitimacy of academics and universities engaging with political, cultural, social, economic questions and engaging with the public. And I think a lot of our work, the way I view our work is, is renegotiating the security bargain of the university. We're saying scholars have a responsibility to get out there. Not only is it not disloyal, as the head of Turkey accused the scholars of saying, but it is their affirmative responsibility to get out and comment on these issues. But that also means that we as a community and the public need to protect them. Uh, and so uh, as we have these conversations for the next two days, I think going to the issue of how do we legitimize that engagement 
in a professional sense as well for purposes of employment and tenure and promotion and, and so forth is part of that conversation rooted though in our extreme cases of legitimizing it for security. You know? so, so I invite everyone, we have coffee out in the expo space and we have a half hour break and then we will return here for our formal plenary opening, okay? Thank you all very much.